So we're going to talk about planning for the non-EM rotator. And so I saw, I think in the beginning, about 50% had a required, um, a required experience. Does anybody have only EM-bound students so they get, so, all right. So yeah, you can get coffee, but I was going to say most of what we'll talk about still, still applies, but we're just going to look at it through, through the lens of the, the, the non-EM rotator. Am I going? Here we go. So there's no internet access, so we're going to go low technology here. And so when you think about the non-EM rotator, what are some words that come to mind? Disinterested. Disinterested. Disengaged. Disengaged. <laughs> Any other words? Spacey. Yeah. And so I think, un, you know, sort of unmotivated. And so what we're really talking about, though, is people who just have not chosen emergency medicine for their specialty. But it kind of gets tagged with these things. We, we sort of group them, group them together. And so this is unscientific data, but based on my, my own experience. And so the M3s in general are still really motivated. They don't really know what they want to do yet. If you still have clerkship grades, they're highly motivated to get that honors. They know it's going to be on their transcript. And then the closer you get to that M4 year, you get on this steep decline in motivation. And then right around that peri match period, it's almost like, are you there? You know, hello. Um, and there's really not a lot of motivation. And then this small uptick right at the end when they're a little bit scared, like, oh my gosh, it's eight weeks, and I'm going to be the one that someone's calling about this. I need, you know, I need to know what, what to do. And so rather than be reactive, I want you to try and think about being proactive and how you're going to, how you're going to deal with these students because they're going to keep coming. And then also instead of, you know, sometimes we think about planning for or not planning or dealing with like these students, but try and take the other side of that coin and think about, you know, what are the benefits both to you as the clerkship director and to the student for coming through an EM rotation. And so for you, it's an opportunity to influence specialty selection. And a lot of times, students pick their specialty based on their experience during their rotation. And so giving them a good quality experience, you may influence their decision to go into EM. You can also impact their view of emergency medicine. There are tons of misconceptions out there that students may have heard about emergency medicine. And this is really your chance to show the abilities and the limitations of our specialty and what we do each and, each and every day. And to promote collaboration because they may not go into EM, but they may be your consultant in a year. They may be the person that's calling you on the phone to send somebody in. And so really trying to establish that with them. And if you are a required rotation, it also gives you political capital in the medical school. And so that often comes with you know, resources and other, um, other advantages for your clerkship. For students, while there are lots of benefits to doing an EM rotation, um, I think really in patient care, it's their opportunity to evaluate undifferentiated patients because they get that almost nowhere else. It forces them to do that focus history and physical and begin to synthesize information work on developing really quality differential diagnosis. They do procedures, and we do urgent interventions. And so the AAMC has those 13 core and trustable professional activities that all students sh or all residents should be able to do on day one of residency without direct supervision. And so EPA 10 is recognize an urgent or emergent situation and begin intervention. And so that's something that, as a clerkship, you guys could really could really own. Um, prioritizing tasks, really understanding the ED process, you know, being worst makes you first, making sure they understand triage because they're going to come through the ED again, whether it's as a patient, with a family, with a friend, um, or as a consultant. And then recognizing their limits because we all know patients can change um, throughout their course and what sounds like a really stable chest pain coming in by EMS may not be. And that's the opportunity to tell, you know, can that student actually recognize, hey, they have no idea what they're doing, step out of the room and appropriately call, call for help. And so if you're not required, these are some things you could use to sort of advocate for becoming a required rotation for your school as well. So how are we going to plan for this? If I could just briefly, um, just to echo the EPA 10, um, I agree. If, if your um, institution is interested in assessing the students on the 13 EPAs, EPA 10 is the approach to an emergent patient. And that's a great way to s get involved with the medical school if you're not a required clerkship. Um, we published a few cases to the MedEd portal on EPA 10. So if you go to the AAMC MedEd portal and type in EPA 10, you could find some cases that are ready to run 
There's simulations with checklists for EPA 10 that, that we're using at our institution. But I, I totally agree. There, there's also a paper that Glenn Hamilton wrote years ago about how a, a mandatory EM clerkship can help satisfy LCME requirements. So um, if you're interested in making an argument to your institution on why your clerkship should be required, just let us know. We can provide you with re references and resources. So in thinking about planning, planning for the non-EM rotator, I sort of begin with the basis of how does learning actually occur, right? So you have your learner. There's some interaction between the learner and the educator, which you know, happens in this learning environment. And learning is a process that occurs within the learner. And so it's not something we can do to a student. It's something they have to do, you know, for themselves. And so what we can do is set up the rotation in such a way that it really tries to foster learning. And when I thought about this, we'll sort of move from things that I think I have more direct control over to things that are great but have less direct control over. And so for me, obviously, I have the most control over myself. And so really having clear expectations and having a good attitude. Next, using learner-centered approaches in, in teaching. And we'll have a talk later, but really to try and optimize the learning environment. Thank you. And then trying to foster that sense of intrinsic motivation in the student. And so setting and communicating clear expectations of both the didactic and the clinical components can be really important because it helps students know what to expect and it helps you if they're not performing how you want them to, to say, hey, these are the expectations and this is where you're falling short. Sometimes I think we have sort of these hidden expectations of students and then they don't do it and we're like, hey, why didn't you do that? And they're like, well, I didn't know I needed to. And so really just trying to make that crystal clear for them. And then make sure you orient them to your expectations as well as to the emergency department. You know, they need to know basic things, where to eat, where to go to the bathroom, where to put their stuff. And so de really decreasing the barriers for them and seeing the ED as a really great and rich learning environment. It can be helpful to tell them how emergency physicians think, particularly those who have really just been embraced in their specialty of choosing for that fourth year, but like really reminding them like what we want to know, is the patient sick or not sick, you know, and those kinds of things can help orient them to how we're going to be thinking about problems. And then really emphasizing the translatable skills and so they don't have to search for the value in what you're going to teach them. You're going to, you already just show them, you lay, lay it out there for them. Um, and even in our orientation, I use some of our own faculty's experience managing emergencies on a plane, managing them in the gym, at their um, own and I show a picture of Dr. Heimlich who used his own maneuver at his assisted living facility and to really emphasize the point that you never really know when you're going to need the skills that, um, that you're providing in this course for them. And then make sure that all your faculty and residents like you heard about this morning really know what those expectations are. And always inspect what you expect of your students. And so there's no better way for your expectations to go by the wayside if you never check up on them. Because the students tell each other, oh, Dr. Perrick doesn't care about that. She's never given me feedback, or she's never asked to see that sheet that we have to fill out. And so making sure you're looking at all those things that you expect. It should go without saying, but have a good, have a good attitude. Even if you're having a really bad day, you've got to turn that shiny face of the apple outside to your students. Be open and approachable so they can come to you with questions or concerns. Be enthusiastic, usually not a problem for EM. And then really practice mutual respect. And so treat the students with respect. Know their name. Know their specialty. Say hello to them when you see them on shift. Hi, John. Good to see you again. How are you today? And then really acknowledge their past experiences. And for me, this was something I struggled with early on because say a patient or a student presented a patient with chest pain and they were sort of really like off and left field about what they wanted to do. In my brain, I was like, do they not pay attention during the chest pain lecture? Are they not reading? You know, what are they doing? And so then my response to them would be to start, you know, teaching them about, you know, chest pain. But really, if we started talking to them, it's maybe that all their experiences in chest pain have come from cardiology clinic or they've come from cardiology wards. And so they, those cardiologists have a very, you know, different approach. And so, you know, starting to ask them, okay, you know, why do you want to do all this testing or why do you think they can go home? And they're like, well, when I was on cards, this is what they did. And you really can get a better sense for how their past experiences on their, in their medical school careers really influencing their decisions in the ED. And then we need to expect competence. And so you have your expectations, and you should expect that of all your students. And we need them to do more than just become filled with facts that we're going to teach them. And so sometimes I think we go in with the notion that, 
oh, they're not going into EM, maybe they don't care as much, they're going to be disinterested, and so we should really expect from the get-go competence and motivation and interest in all our students. So at mid-rotation, like, I'll ask the students what they're going into, so again, even if it's not EM, again, kind of pointing out how it relates to whatever, they're, whatever it is. So even if it's a primary care specialist, you know, talk to them, you know, one of the things that they should be looking at is all those patients we get from, like, the primary care office, you know, even just the, as simple as how they're sending that patient in, I mean, cause especially, I see more in peds, I do both adult and peds, but on the peds side, like, oh, this, per you know, this person is in distress and retracting, and they're coming by car, and you're like, wait a minute, there's a disconnect from what you're describing. So again, actually talking to the students that, you know, if they're going to that primary care specialty, here's something to think about, here's something to focus on. And then using a learner-centered approach, again, getting to, know, getting to know your students so you do know what specialty they're, they're going into, and really trying to plan time for self-directed learning um, within, within your curric curriculum. We have a case conference at the end of ours, and so the students can you know, read about and present a case that they found really interesting or fascinating that they saw in the emergency department. And we have resources for them, like Nick had mentioned earlier, the CDEM curriculum, so that it gives them a place to start when they want to explore learning more about a topic. And as much as you can, you know, what can you allow for individuation in your curriculum. Millennial learners, they love flexibility and differentiation. And so, you know, are there different sites that you can send people to? Are there different assignments? Can they complete assignments in different, in different ways? Just to give them a little bit of control over what and how they're learning. And we'll talk about bedside teaching techniques this afternoon, but using techniques that really get the students, the students' thoughts first before you're going to just sort of spit out and tell them what you, what you want them to do. And so we'll pause here for a little bit of reflection. And I want you to think back to medical school, to your like least favorite rotation. And if you can't think back quite, quite that far, then maybe think back to residency and think back to the worst time you had and the worst rotation that you had in residency. And so what made it so bad? Does anybody want to share? Feel, feeling like a nuisance and some bitterness. Anybody else? I know, so hated OB, but for the opposite reason. They were like, <laughs> okay, here's the floor. See you next week. And I was like, but I don't know anything OB does. It was totally unsupervised and terrible. <laughs> so too much, too much, too much autonomy. A lot of pontification, observation. Yeah, and so I think you all, and you know, the point of this is it's really a lot of times the people, you know, the people and the environment that you go into, which is why the learning environment is really important. Um, and I'll just talk about it briefly here, but it's so important just to create and maintain a positive learning, learning environment to support and challenge students. And two things that I've run to in my tenure as a clerkship director is just being really mindful of professional humor. We use it so that we're able to do what we do every day, but to the student that comes on shifts and here's your resident making a joke about orthopedics, uh, that's, they don't have the experience to process that or the context to really understand that. And so just being mindful of that and really pay attention to the oral presentation. Nothing devalues students more than if you interrupt them two minutes into their oral presentation without good reason or explanation, or you don't even take the time to listen to their, to listen to their plan. Um, and you can say you're open and approachable and happy that they're there. But in, as in all things, your actions always, always speak louder than your words. And so you are constantly a role model for your students, which is a great responsibility, but it's also a really great opportunity. And you can model what to do with uncertainty or when you don't know something, you know, how do you look it up? How do you approach that? How do you approach these maybe some difficult, um, difficult conversations? And so really then... Like 
So I try and be proactive about it. And so uh, we were talking earlier, there's a great uh, Cord Emra video about the emergency medicine presentation. And so we touch on this in orientation about you know how long, how long their presentation should be. I will talk with them at the beginning of our shift together. And before they start talking, I will say, I know you've taken a really great history and physical, but I want you to tell me in three minutes or less what you've gotten, what you think's going on, and what you want to do about it. And so I try and set those expectations early to avoid like that 10 or 15 minute presentation. Um, and then I, I frankly, I try not to do anything when they're, when they're presenting. And if, you know, if a nurse interrupts, then I'll just say, you know, excuse me, or some, you know, just let the student know I'm still listening. And then if it's something where I have to like get up and go to a room, then I'll say, okay, I want to hear the rest of your presentation. Come with me to this resuscitation and incoming ambulance and we'll pick up, you know, pick up where we left off and then try and try and really circle circle back so in regards to the typing like what i mean so i'll take notes with the medical students i'll actually let them know that you know i'm going to type what you're saying you know so they know that i'm listening but i'm still trying to get at least like a framework for that note so when i come back to it i can kind of fill it in so again it's like kendra said it's you know setting some expectations early on but then also like when you're doing these other things you know let them know that you are listening and you know why you're doing it that sort of thing. I, I also think we underestimate how much time we overestimate how much time we have to dedicate to the student. And by that I mean, I do the exact same things you do. So if I get called out to, the, to triage to assess a patient for a stroke, I'll grab the student, I'll say, walk out there with me. And literally, this interaction with the student might be five to eight minutes. And you'll get on your evaluation, this was so great, this attending brought me out there and took some time. We have a hyperbaric unit, and sometimes I cover hyperbarics. And as I'm walking over there, I'll bring the student, and I will talk about Boyle's Law and Henry's Law and what we look for in a patient that we dive. And literally, it's about a five-minute, like, there and back. And, um, and it's not that I don't pay attention to the student the rest of the shift. I, I, I try to, but I think the students also recognize how busy we are. They, they watch us even when we don't realize they are and we're getting an EKG to sign and we have to go here and go there and, and th that isn't lost on the student. So just dedicating at least some time every shift at the beginning of the shift to ask the student what their learner level is, what they want to focus on today, and then some interaction during the shift and at the end what did they learn and fill out their CPA. <laughs> Uh, you'll be surprised how well regarded you'll be as an educator, and it, it's not a ton of work, really. And so, ideally, to try and motivate the student, right, because that would be the ideal, you want them to get their own sense of motivation for, you know, during your course. And so, trying to promote mastery orientation and growth in the student. And so, mastery orientation as, compo as opposed to, like, performance orientation. And so, performance orientation is, I want to do this because I want an honors in the course, or I want to get a 90% on this test. Whereas, mastery orientation is they want to do it because they want to be, they want to be a good doctor. And so, medical knowledge is one that I, we get this frequently, right? People, right? read more increased knowledge base right and so rather than telling the student which is this is would be a performance a performance orientation hey if you want to pass this course and pass my test I need you to read more and to learn these things no what I try and say is hey it's been noted that your medical knowledge is not where is not really where it should be for this rotation by increasing your medical knowledge it's going to make you more efficient at the bedside because you're not going to have to look things up you're going to get all the information you need from the patient the first time you visit the room and it's going to help you go faster in your focused history and physicals because you're going to know what questions to ask and so really trying to frame it for them so that we want, them, we want them to master these tasks. We want them to continue to grow. And really emphasizing the value of the clinical shifts and the course components is gonna, eat, is gonna increase the task value for the students. And so uh, recently I had a very recalcitrant sort of anesthesia student that I just was trying and trying and I couldn't really get engaged and the student had to do a pelvic exam. And so I was like, all right, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but like this is not gonna be easy. And so I was finally like, okay, it's really the same as intubating. It's a bright light in a dark hole and we're looking for a target object. <laughs> and, and the student was like, oh yeah, okay. And for that, that it, that's what got them off their chair and motivated to go do this with me. And so really trying to show them that task value 
and thinking about their own self-efficacy. And so that's how they perceive, are they gonna be able to do this or not? And so you can set that up for them in orientation by removing barriers and showing them that they can do this. And so if you increase the task value, you increase their perceived self-efficacy, their motivation is gonna go, gonna go up every, every time. And give them permission to try and fail. Right. I just have a quick question about that. So for the students like that in special, growing into specialty, so you know, the orthopod, it's super easy to get motivated, it's just be like, okay, you'll see every orthopedic thing that comes through the door, but but what have you seen succeed in getting like, hey, you should probably know how to evaluate a patient with chest pain and shortness of breath if they come into your clinic or your next year when you're an intern. Like the ones who are like vastly different from what they're going into, that it, you know, they they can be super motivated to see the fracture, but they don't really want to see the belly pain. Right, so I try to not let them see just the fractures, and so, um, and so usually I will ask them. I will say, "All right, I know you're interested in orthopedics. You're going to be an orthopedic, and we'll make sure that you see some orthopedics today. But what else scares you? What's going to scare you the most on your first night on call?" What phone call are you going to get that you're going to say, I don't know what to do with this? And try and get from them, like, what makes them worried or what complaint are they, like, what would be the one thing if it came up on the board you would not want to see? All right, well, let's see that and figure out why. And then, and then I'll try and throw in, like, the ortho. So, like, hey, why don't you go see that belly pain? And then there's a dislocated pinky that we can go see together, like, to, you know, to let them see some of that stuff, too. I don't, I'll open it up. Do you guys have other? No, I'd say I do a similar. I mean, Kendra talked about, like, even early on. Basically saying them, so it's part of the orientation. I'll say, you know, you, you have plenty of time. You have residency to go learn, like all the. And I think sounds like we all end up picking on orthopedics, because um, I bring up orthopedics as well. But it says, it's the what do you what are you afraid of in the middle of the night? You know, what are you going to do when someone calls you for chest pain? What are you going to do when someone says, hey, your post-op patient's got belly pain? How are you going to evaluate that patient? And I tell them the story, like you know, when I was a resident and I was on my orthopedic rotation, you know, got called in the middle of the night with chest pain, and you talk to the attending, and they say, okay, what cardiology say? And it's like. Well, cardiology is not going to see them till the morning. So what are you going to do in that first 10, 15? How are you going to determine if cardiology does need to see them now versus they can wait till the morning? So again, trying to relate to them, you know, what are you going to do during that, you know, your first year, your second year where you're taking the floor call? Yeah, I do the same thing. I, we used to call our emergency medicine clerkship the approach to the undifferentiated patient. And I always started that lecture with, it's July 1st at 5 a.m. and you're cross covering, you're on, you're an ortho doc and you're called with shortness of breath. Mrs. Jones is an 86 year old lady who's post-op day two from a hip replacement. She's short of breath. What are you going to do? And I have the students shout out, what are you worried about? PE, pulmonary edema, CHF, MI, uh, fat embolism, you know, and they'll throw out different things. What about too much pain medicine? What about she fell down? She has a rib fracture. What if she has a pneumothorax? She was on a vent. And then I have them go through what they would order. And um, I feel like that works really well. I mean, it's kind of what we all do, I guess. But um, I think if you start to play on their fear of being an intern, um, it, it helps a little bit. You know, as a clerkship director, you're not going to have any trouble in May June, July, August, and September. Students are engaged, they're interested, and a lot of them are going into EM. Where you make the big bucks is in February and March, trying to engage this group that has already done their residency interviews. So I, I agree, I think those are really good ways to, to do that. The other thing, too, is you can play the what if game for the abdominal pain. You know, well, what if they had a femur fracture? No, you know, like try, trying to really like, you know, like draw them, draw them more into the into the scenario. Um, and so also giving them permission to try something. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and I think we've all seen, you know, the medical students, many of them have, you know, been A-plus students all, all through their lives, and so they carry that with them to the clerkship, and oftentimes they avoid things that they don't know as, don't know as much about because they don't want to, you know, look stupid or not look skilled in your eyes, and so really giving them permission to go towards what they don't know or, like you do, setting clear expectations at the beginning about the things that they're supposed to see can just be, be really helpful for them. And so I wanted to leave some time to open it up. If you guys had um, any non-EM students that you've had particular challenges with that you wanted to talk about or techniques that you found really helpful and wanted, wanted to share, share with the group. Um, I had a fourth year anesthesia student who was just very disengaged, probably in February. And um, I found that I really was able to interact with him when I acknowledged that, hey man, I know this is your fourth year, you're checking out, you're like ready to go buy your new house or whatever it is that you're gonna do. And made everything relevant to anesthesia for him. And he started to get really in engaged and I, I don't know, that was like a mini success. Anyone else? The other thing I'll just say, but this doesn't happen a ton of times, but I've had it happen, is a student rotates with us, us in March, and in September, later in the next year, you get an email saying, hey, you know what, I think I, I, think I went into the wrong thing. Like, I really love DM in March, and I've had this happen maybe three times in 10 years, so it doesn't happen a lot, but um, one of the students recently was a student who matched in um, IMPEDS, and you know, got a hold of me and said, "Hey, I think I made uh, the wrong choice." And she did EM in March with us and wound up uh, matching into emergency medicine. And now she's kind of looking at our fellowship. So um, these students, you know, do, we need to be invested in them as much as we want them to invest in us. And you know, sometimes you'll get a little payoff like that. So, and otherwise, you know, you'll also. Um, I've had some of the orthopedic interns come down to the ED and say, "Hey." Um, thanks for the rotation. It really helped me the other night when X happened. Or, you know, so it, that doesn't happen a lot at the times. About as many times I'll have one of the resident consultants come down and be a total SOB, and I'll be like, you were just a student with me. How are you like this? But um, that happens too, but, you know, we, we have more success stories, I think, than failures. All right. And so just know the benefits of having non-EM rotators um, and then, you know, just make sure you have an explicit kind of plan for them and try and set some of these things up at the front end. So next we will talk about some active learning strategies in the, in the clerkship. So what percent of time would you guys say that your students spend in classroom or lecture-based activities? So zero to 10%, 10 to 20%, 20 to 40%? Anybody more than 40%? No? All right, so everybody has a, at least some. And then how do you feel about sort of the level of active learning in your, in your classroom, classroom and lecture-based activities? At the right level, too much? Anyone feel like they have too much? Anyone feel like they have not enough? All right, no one's really raising their hand here. So we'll, we'll move on. And for those of you that feel like you've got this nailed just right, please, please, you know, speak up, speak up as we move along. So what, what is active learning? Sim sessions. Sim sessions. What else? Team-based learning. Right. Small groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, you know, I, I like this metaphor, thinking of, you know, lecture, where it's kind of this sage on the stage, it's some expert up at the front of a big lecture hall sort of spewing their expertise out onto the audience, and the student tends to be just an empty vessel waiting to be filled with this content that is, that is coming at them. And it's a very teacher-centered teacher um, modality compared to more of the guide on the side where the teacher is there to help facilitate the learning process, but it's really, it's really learner-centered. And again, it's this idea you're really trying to foster 
the student to learn because you can't actually make them learn. And so this has been shown to deepen, deepen knowledge. Students have better, better retention of knowledge when it's taught in a more active and learner-centered way. This is one of my favorite, favorite quotes about learning. And again, it just reminds us that learning, learning is a process. And we don't know if learning is occurring or not because we can't see it in the mind of the learner. We can only infer that, has, that it actually has occurred by some product that they produce or some performance, performance that they do. And so the goals of classroom teaching um, can be multiple, but I think it's important to remember that there are some. Sometimes we tend to want to just take everything to sim or increase these other activities, but classroom learning can be important. And things that we tend not to think about so much, but is teaching students how to learn. So those metacognitive aspects of learning can really, you can help observe them in the classroom for the student and really help them improve in that area. And so as you begin to think about implementing different instructional strategies, these are kind of the three general rules that I live by when I'm thinking about how I want to teach something. So you always want to make sure there's congruence between whatever the learning objective is and the instructional strategy you're using to teach it. And so if you want students to be able to analyze something, then you have to give them the opportunity to analyze something. If you want them to perform something, perform an I.O., a humoral I.O. successfully in a, you know, in a simulated situation, then you have to use instructional strategies that will allow them to reach that objective. And you need to use multiple instructional strategies because one is not going to reach every student in the course. And again, millennial learners, they've shown, like to have flexibility to kind of pick strategies and how they learn. And always think about resources. Sometimes I come back from conferences and I'm like, that is the best thing ever and I'm totally going to do that. But do you have the faculty to do it? Do your faculty have the right training? Do you have the time? Do you have time in the curriculum to do it? So always being mindful. And so I think of, you know, things you can do to increase active learning as sort of the first batch of stuff is sort of the mix-ins, things that you can kind of throw into your lecture to make it more active without having to redo a big chunk of your instruction. And so you can use pause procedures where you just pause. Um, you can have students write down an answer to a question. I like the one-minute paper. And so you just give the students an index card. On the front, they write one thing that they've learned that they feel is really important. And on the back, they write the one thing that's most confusing to them. And so that lets you know where you're at in your instruction. And it gives the students time to stop and think Think about what they're actually learning. Using case-based scenarios is always great, and you can use them beginning, middle, and and just that cognitive talk through um, and that cognitive role modeling of how you think can be really helpful. Commitment exercises, um, which is what we did at the beginning, right? Asking students to commit to something. Um, you can use hands, or you can use some of the more you know advanced polling things. And again, this is really helpful too if you don't know the level of where your students are at, because for chest pain, if you're going to be talking about the differential, but your students already know that, and you've done a few questions in the beginning with them, and you see, hey, they already got this, you know you can spend your time, spend your time somewhere else. Concept maps, has anybody done concept maps before? And so these are like the little circle and stick drawings that you see where you put the high-level concepts up top, the subconcepts below, and then you link, link the concepts. And so in one of our courses, this is an example of a concept map developed by the students. And this is for evaluating an undifferentiated toxicology patient. And so over the four weeks of the course, the students develop and refine this algorithm. Then they practice with it in simulation. And then they get to refine it again. And then the groups present to each other. And so you can give them, you can make them do it de novo, which is what we do. You can give them partially filled concept maps and have them, you know, start have them fill it in during during the lecture time. And then utilizing social media, which Nick would did a nice demonstration of that for us for us earlier. But whether you have, you know, <laughs> Whether um, you want people to, you know, tweet during it, tweet or read other tweets from conferences, or maybe you have a tweet wall up while you're talking so people can make, make comments, but really just trying to engage, um, engage in different ways. The next group of things are kind of the add-ons, and so these are things that are not necessarily difficult to do, but you may have to, you know, modify your lecture or change the timing timing of your instruction. And so, think pair share is um, really popular. So you just have them think about something, pair with a neighbor, talk about it, and then share share in the large group. You can do role play. Um, we do this with consult, like how to talk to a consultant. We have a difficult real-to-life case. They make the phone calls, and then they take on the perspective of the service that they actually called, and then they have to work to figure out how they're going to resolve the issue, having a debate, 
educational games or sometimes serious games, we use the emergency simulation game. Um, and it's basically like a piece of paper that has ED rooms and then the students get to decide, they have a certain amount of money. They get to decide how many rooms they want to staff and what acuity level can be seen in those rooms. And then they get simulated patients for 24 hours. And at the end of the day, we see which team built the ED that makes the most money. Um, but it's really good to teach some general principles of operations, of operations management. And so the students really enjoy that. Snowball is just really fun if you have somewhat of a dry topic and need to get people up. And so you ask a question and then you have students write their thoughts or ideas down on a piece of paper and then they literally crunch it up and throw it like snowballs. And then they get up and pick up somebody else's paper and read and then can have a discussion about you know some of them that they've read. Um, you can also do it with an index card. And so again, ask the question, people write their ideas down on the index card. And then you know, give them 30 seconds, and they, you pass the index cards all around so you don't end up with your own. And then on the back, they write a number from 1 to 5 about how they like that idea. And then you can do two or three more rounds of passing. And then you look through the cards and see which were the highest rated, which were the lowest rated. And then as a group, you can talk about you know, why do people think these were the best? Why, why are these the least? And um, just a fun way to get discussion going. The next group of things. Um, is really, you know, sort of the lecture alternative. And the most popular right now is the flipped, is the flipped classroom. Does anybody use flipped classroom activities? Oh, good. Um, and so basically, pre-class, they do something to prepare for whatever's in class. And then after class, they're supposed to do something that's more deep learning about the topic and, and self-directed. In my experience using this, uh, where we fell flat initially was for that pre-class, we sort of left it too open-ended. And so we weren't specific enough in the assignment that we needed students to do. And we didn't track whether they did it or not. And so some would come really prepared and some would come obviously completely unprepared. And so we actually now can track that in the student's learning management system. And so that's helped us make this, um, make this more effective. Other options, team-based learning. Does anyone do team-based learning? Yeah, great. Um, and so again, this is very, you know, it's very similar. In phase one, there's a preparatory phase where the student does individually. Then they come in and there's readiness assessment. And so they get an individual readiness assessment test. And then they do a team test and then they have a class discussion. We don't do this in our clerkship. We do it in other areas of the medical school. And one nice thing I have found is that students usually think they're going to do better when they do it by themselves. But actually, the teams in general always do better than an, any individual student. And so it's a nice way to highlight for them sort of the importance of teamwork. And then once they've done their readiness assessment again, then they do an application exercise as an individual, as a team, and then with a class with a class discussion. This also allows you to assess teamwork in a you know in a different way and to assess their communication and professionalism as well. And finally, there's problem-based um, problem learning. And so some type of legitimate clinical problems assigned. The group sort of self-identifies what they need to know, and then they usually go out into the world, learn what they need to know, and then come back and, um, and apply it to the, to the problem at hand. And we don't use problem-based learning very much because it's a lot of time because they need time away from the problem and time to come back. And you also need facilitators for this compared to team-based learning where one facilitator can do a larger group, a much larger group of students because they're working, working in their small teams. Anybody that uses these or wants to use these have any thoughts or about how they've implemented them or challenges that they've faced? The only thing I would say is um, with a lot of these tactics, team-based learning, problem-based learning, and SIM, you, you probably are better off, at least early on, using a small group of dedicated faculty because you want inter-rater reliability between your faculty. And um, so, you know, what we do is we, for the SIM, we have about five or six faculty that do all the SIM the, for the EPA 10. And same thing with, um, not in the EM clerkship, but we do a TBL on end-of-life discussion in our ambulatory sub-I, and we use the same kind of five faculty for that. So um, the issues become, how do you pay those people? Are they compensated? Do they have protected time? So those are things to think about. Um, you know, so it might help you as a clerkship director to have an assistant clerkship director or a small group of people who are dedicated to medical student education who can lead these initiatives because otherwise it's hard to get faculty to buy in to teach some of these things. Yeah, go ahead.
So the way we do it, we have, um, so our first two days of the curriculum, because um, we have different sites, we don't, we just have the like, first two days are like their didactic days that are required. And we do a, a mix, you know, so we have some more active, some labs, some simulation, along with some didactics. And what we did kind of get to what Nick said with the learners, because all these t take um, some specialty, or some, you know, you, know, you need, need to know how to do it to make it active and to be able to adapt. So what we did is we actually created teams for each of the lectures meaning that we have like one lecture topic, be it like chest pain, we actually have three residents and a faculty member that kind of are the ones doing that lecture. Because then it spreads it out, so they're only doing three over the entire year. But our faculty, the ones that are generally doing those are our educators, those that are interested in doing it. Um, we also have other things through our department to kind of incentivize, um, not necessarily like paying specifically for their time, but it actually goes in, we have the educational value unit, which actually goes into their, um, uh, bonus structure. They have to have X amount of hours of educational time that goes in the bonus structure. But so we have the same team that's going to give this lecture each time because again, the more active you make it, it really does require more practice doing that versus someone kind of coming in off the, off the street and giving it. And if I could just echo one point that you made, I, I also, um, it took me a long time to understand backwards design or tying your objectives to your assessments by a teaching and learning activity. Um, when, when I was just out of residency, like emergency medicine to me was a hodgepodge of cool experiences the students do, like fly with med flight and have a toxicology day and do pediatric airways. And it, it took me a while to realize that you need set objectives and you need to decide how you're going to assess those objectives. So you mentioned um, doing an I.O. You'd never assess an I.O. With a, with a written test. It would be a checklist where you observe the student doing it. So you have to just think about those things. So for you, your residency lectures, you're going to want to think about what objective you're trying to teach. And if that objective is how to approach these nine diagnoses on an undifferentiated patient, a poison patient, uh, abdominal pain, a dyspnea, a trauma, then teaching those with a resident lecture is, is probably okay. But if you're trying to teach the students how to suture, a resident lecture wouldn't be the best way to yeah. do that. So just think about, you know, think about those things when you incorporate, you know, your residents into, into how they're teaching. because res everybody hates lectures, and, and it was easy, but the problem was is the medical students would say, I know all of these things already, and then you get in the clinical setting. And so we use a simulation-based curriculum, and we do it, we have one three-hour sort of set a week, and so that's really nice because the cases are the same. They rotate every year. They're always exactly identical. And we have them in a literally a three three ring binder so that whoever's doing it can pull it off the shelf and and sort of step in and do it. And so the residents are really critical for us having the numbers to be able to supervise them appropriately. And so that's been a great way to incorporate residents. It's little preparation. The residents like doing it, and they they can just sort of also fill in at the last minute. Or if you if a faculty member gets sick, so anybody can step into that role. And we do something similar too with our residents. Like they teach our splinting, like our splinting lab, and so it's really just like plug and play for them. It's something they should know know really well. So it's really really easy for them to come in. So, anybody hear anything that was new to them that they feel like really inspired that they want to share with a group that they would think about implementing in their clerkship? So I think that's, that's important. And so when you move to, sometimes when we think about flip classroom and we try and make these 
activity is asynchronous, right? Like we forget, we have to keep track of that time too. And so you have to know about how much time your assignments are gonna take for the students. And so I deliberately build in time for the curriculum where our students come into a classroom sitting every five days, five days a week in the morning. And so we build in time for them to do the asynchronous activity. So we sort of remove that barrier of them having to find other time. And then we've, we found mostly that just letting them know we're actually like watching them and making sure they're doing it has been has been helpful for them to come prepared and then sometimes their group gets let down if they don't have the, have the work done and so adding that level of group accountability um, we've had more more success that way so all right so just in you know in conclusion just the more active you can make the learning the more the students are going to remember we can't we can't make our students make our students learn. Um, we just can create conditions that really foster their own learning. And so think about you know if you can either just mixing something into one of your lectures to try to try and get it to be more active, adding something on, or just try like one activity in a flipped format and see how, and see how it goes. Don't try and like redo your whole whole curriculum. Just you know one one small thing at a time.